so read and get started. No time was lost in beginning operations. Inexperienced newcomers were given a few brief instructions in the art of selling books and periodicals. Then after earnest prayer, seems like I read that. I maybe I am. I'm on the wrong page. Sorry. Let's start again. Thus, within a few weeks of the opening of the New York Mission, three other centers of endeavor were opening and operating. The aim of their founders was to develop many of these branch missions and to place them under the management of consecrated laymen who would, with the assistance of workers from the central mission, be gaining an experience in leadership. The new workers, launching out in faith, were thrilled and inspired by some of the experiences they met when one woman stated in a positive manner to a young man who called at her door, I'm a Christian already. I don't need your literature. He asked, how about your husband? She answered, oh, he is an avowed infidel. I don't want you to meet him, for he abuses every professed Christian he meets. The young man asked, have you ceased um, have you ceased praying for him? No, said the woman, I pray for him every day. Then how do you know but that the Lord is answering your prayers in sending me to you? Finally, the woman reluctantly named a time when the worker might call and find her husband at home. This he did and their interview resulted in an appointment for Bible study. The topic, The Glorious Coming of Christ, was presented by a young woman who in turn was receiving her first lessons at the mission. This was the first Bible study she had ever prepared. Both the infidel and his Christian wife sat spellbound throughout the study when asked at its close if they would like to have the worker come again the man replied yes this is the most intelligent and reasonable view of the scriptures i have ever heard regular studies followed and before their conclusion the one time infidel was rejoicing in the message of salvation. The mission chief was ever on the lookout for idlers in the church. To these he would extend the invitation, come, come work in the Lord's vineyard. Whenever he heard of a promising member not definitely connected with any soul-saving enterprise, he would visit or write, inviting that person to join the Bible training school. Many responded, and the mission family rapidly increased in number. There were times when funds were scarce, with no cash on hand to meet current bills. In such crises, the situation was laid before the group for discussion. The workers usually solved the problem by resolving to devote more time to selling books and periodicals. In this way, all would help make up the deficit. Often, too, Elder Haskell would run across a well-to-do friend of the mission whom he would persuade to extend assistance in the form of welcome cash. In a personal letter, he relates a conversation with such a person during one of these crises. I told him that we are trying to enlarge our work and that this would require funds, that we are trying to obtain a thousand dollars from ten hundred dollar men. This thousand dollars is to aid us when we fail in donations from other quarters. 
He says, that's a good financial scheme. I told him that I have a friend on 87th Street West, told him that I thought of calling to see him one of these days to have him help us. He said, call over. Your work shall not stop for want of means. I guess he meant the call is over. Your work's not going to stop. And hopefully he helped. Going on. There were two scriptures which the elder knew how to use convincingly. One, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts, Haggai 2.8. And the other, the liberal soul shall be made fat, Proverbs 11.25. In October, the mission was able to secure the use of of the centrally located hall called the Metropolitan Lyceum on 59th Street, in which to conduct a series of Bible lectures. The hall had rented for $500 a month, but in the providence of God, Elder Haskell secured it for one-tenth that amount simply by meeting the monthly payments on a mortgage. Other favors were readily obtained from friendly businessmen. These included lumber required for building the platform, the printing of announcements, and the loan of a good organ, and 500 chairs for use in the auditorium. Sunday evening Bible lectures were given by two young ministers, J. A. Brunson and Luther Warren. There were several rooms in the building suitable for weekday classes, Sabbath school, and other special meetings and gatherings. The first baptism was held in a beautiful spot on the East River. A new church was organized with Haskell as elder, known as Church Number no. 3. It was a lively, wide-awake group of people, active in soul-winning even before baptism. The widowed Adventist sister, a widowed Adventist sister, drove the Haskells to her home in the country near the East River, a mile and a half beyond the electric railway terminal, where, surrounded by the beauties of nature, she was conducting a private boarding school. During their visit, Mrs. Haskell remarked, You must charge high tuition to be able to maintain such an elegant home and so fine a pair of horses. The sister replied, No, we charge only $20 a month for board tuition, and the care of clothing, and only half that amount for some children who come from poor families. But we do plan carefully. She let the Haskells in on some financial secrets which she had discovered worked well in New York. She offered them the loan of a small hand printing press, this was thankfully accepted and was set up in a room at the mission. With the saving in printing expense, the workers were able to enlarge their announcements to include sermon outlines with the usual time and place being noted. Thus, the 18,000 handbills distributed over the city that week carried the outline for the coming Sunday evening, evening discourse, What is True Sabbath Keeping, with the texts, and there, therefore everyone who was handed a notice received a brief Bible tract. Before starting out to distribute announcements, it was wor the workers' practice to spread them out before the Lord, to ask Him to send angels to watch over them and bring them into the possession of truth-seeking people.
the workers had many evidences that these prayers were answered. Officials of the elevated railroads permitted them to distribute handbills freely, either in the cars or at the stations. By this means, thousands of notices flowed in all directions throughout New York City. In 1902, health education classes were conducted for the public. Many intelligent, progressive people attended and showed their appreciation in the form of voluntary contributions. Many of these people deplored the practice of drug dosing, so common among physicians at that time. They appreciated the demonstrations of simple home treatments given by capable nurses in these health classes. At times in the evening classes, at times in the evening classes, instruction was given on the selection and preparation of plain, wholesome, nutritious, yet appetizing foods. The advantages of a meatless diet were presented. Both men and women were encouraged to attend. It was important that all should understand the principles of healthful living. A six weeks school of health was held, the leading feature of which was a series of 12 lectures by Dr. Geisel of the Battle Creek Sanitarium. A class was also taught in designing and constructing healthful clothes for women. Mrs. Luther Warren, whose husband was engaged in public evangelism in Brooklyn, conducted this class assisted by lay members of the church. The women's world was at that time emerging from the deadly tight lacing epoch. Hoops and bustles were relics of the past. However, corsets and other constricting garments were still worn. Numerous skirts suspended from the waist dragged heavily upon the internal organs and the free use of the limbs was impeded by long dresses. Efforts to design a dress convenient and healthful, and at the same time graceful and beautiful, were receiving favorable notice from many fashion-weary women. Mrs. Warren's dressmaking classes were well attended. As an outgrowth of friendships which Elder Haskell made with New York newspaper men, the mission received favorable mention in some of the leading papers. Occasionally, a reporter would be sent to gather first-hand information by actually attending the classes. Calls began coming into the mission for efficient, trained workers to fill important posts in other cities. It was not easy for the Haskells to release workers upon whom they had bestowed much time and labor and whom they could ill spare. But they willingly gave up some of the most capable helpers, happy in the thought that they were thus helping to build up God's work in many places. Then they would search out new recruits and begin again the joyous but arduous task of training beginners in their Bible training school. It was during the summer of 1902 that a new periodical was born. Mrs. Haskell had received several requests for written outlines for the lessons she was teaching. The thought came to her, why not print these lessons and send them out through the mail and thus extend the influence of our Bible training school here in New York City. It was natural that the paper would be called Bible Training School, and it was launched in June 1902. 
Because there was no time for such occupations during the day, Elder and Mrs. Haskell sat up nights preparing copy. At first it was printed in New York, but later sent to South Lancaster, Massachusetts, to be printed by the Academy Press. Each issue contains several prepared Bible lessons to aid lay members who wish to give studies in private homes. <laughs> Besides using the topical Bible lessons, readers could learn how to construct and give their own Bible studies. The paper also contained brief, crisp articles on important phases of Bible truth, instruction on healthful living and home nursing, Bible quizzes, and other items intended to stimulate interest in Bible study. <clears throat> Excuse me. The journal filled a real need in our ranks. Thus was begun a publishing enterprise that was to grow and to become an integral part of the Haskell Missionary Program. It paralleled their labors to the close of their active ministry. The subscription list grew steadily. Tract societies used clubs in their missionary efforts both in the homeland and abroad. Letters of appreciation arrived from church members who were using the Bible study outlines. Some letters came from individuals in other churches who were using the lessons as guides in Bible study groups. Longing to see the Bible truths in the little paper made available to a larger number of people. The Haskells prayed for men and women who they, whom they might train as salesmen to sell it on city streets and in business offices. For a year they continued praying. They were determined not to divert any regular call porters who were selling truth-filled books for the denominational publishing houses, but to find men and women in their secular employment whom they could initiate in gospel service. In time, their faith was more than rewarded. Among those volunteering to sell the Bible training school were men, women, and children. Some worked full-time jobs, others only occasionally. <laughs> There were also the halt, halt, the lame, and the blind. Mrs. Haskell later wrote about two girls who spent their summers together selling the papers from city to city. She wrote of a crippled lad who signed himself Wandering Willie. This boy had taken 10,000 journals and was beginning to sell with the objective of founding a home for cripples. She also told of blind brother Baylor, who, with his wife and small son, were supporting a seven-member orphan's home from the prophets. Besides buying a gospel tent and assisting in other missionary endeavors, Selling Bible training school was to become a favorite method of raising money for the starting of home and missionary mission home and foreign missionary enterprises and of maintaining them during lean years. In lots of ten thousand, salesmen bought the special issues for three cents a copy and sold them for ten. Regular copies were a bargain at five cents apiece. If he was endeavoring to aid some special missionary project, the worker would give a part or all of his commission to the object of his endeavors. Much of the responsibility of assembling material for this paper was carried by Mrs. Haskell.
the opening article in practically every number was from the pen of Ellen G. White. Elder Haskell was a frequent contributor. Haskell's own articles and outlines were interspersed among contributions by such writers as J. N. Loughborough, H. W. Cottrell, and his wife, and W. A. Spicer, and others. Illustrations and poetry were not lacking. One poem representative of the aim and whole endeavor is found in Bible Training School, May 1906, and it goes like this. May every soul that touches mine be at the slightest contact, get therefore some good, some little grace, one kindly thought, one aspiration yet unfelt, one bit of courage from the darkening sky, one gleam of faith to brave the thickening ills of life, one glimpse of brighter skies beyond the gathering mists to make this life worthwhile and heaven a surer heritage. Next chapter is entitled The Crisis in New York. In January 1902, about six months after the Haskells had established their mission headquarters on West 57th Street, another evangelist in the city, E.E. E. Frank, began meetings in Carnegie Hall, only three blocks away. New York was large enough for several good men, and the Haskells did all they could to preserve cordial relations with the younger worker. As vice president of the newly formed Greater New York Conference, Haskell wrote to Mrs. White, quote, I had thought that I had not been as cordial as I should have been to Elder Frank. So I wrote him. I would stand shoulder to shoulder with him. Immediately on the heels of this came your two testimonies that showed my mind was led in the channel of your testimony. Now, Sister White, I do not want that you should think that I shall not stand by Brother Frank. I shall invite him over to the house and pray with him and pray for his work. I have no other intention at all. I propose to stand on your testimony not to see bad results, but to see good results. Carnegie Hall was only a few blocks from the Metropolitan Lyceum, where Elder Haskell's interest was centered. Frank was young, vigorous, and eloquent. He conducted a live and well-organized campaign but his methods of advertising were bizarre, sometimes bordering on the grotesque. Before coming to New York, he had conducted an evangelistic series near Chicago. There he had prepared a two-horse wagon with a large platform upon it with a bell fixed in the center and over that a small tent. Around the whole platform, he had banners upon which were printed, Which day do you keep? Which day is the Sabbath? etc. This was driven through the streets of Kankakee. A boy beside the platform, ringing the large bell to attract attention. When G. A. Irwin then president of the general conference heard about it he hastened to tell elder frank that he did not think such a method of advertising properly represented the truth as that was the method resorted to by all sorts of shows many of which were low down and immoral 
Elder Irwin then read to Frank a statement Sister White had written, quote, The man who is to come to Chicago must not on any account enter into controversies with any man. He will seek to be original, and in doing this will get odd notions, and we want nothing of that kind to come in. Our work must move in a dignified, in elevated, ennobling manner. Elder Frank replied that he would drop the wagon idea, but he continued to be, as expressed by Elder Irwin, a very expensive and extravagant man in his work so that when they come to ask him to do as other ministers do, he at once rebels and persists in his own way. End quote. Of course, Haskell received only his salary with no operating or advertising allowance. To him, Frank's procedure was inexcusable, ostentation and extravagance. Further, he feared, feared that Elder Warren's preaching in Metropolitan Hall could not hold an audience if the full force of interest and attention became focused on the larger, more dramatic evangelistic campaign being conducted by Elder Frank. The latter regarded Haskell's work as divisive, however. As Haskell wrote in June, the meetings in both halls were successful in maintaining a good audience. At the end of one year's occupancy of the Metropolitan Hall, Elder Haskell was unable to renew the lease. Among those who had been attending the meetings in that hall were a large number of black people. They, these had been visited by the regular workers and also by a young member of their own group, a Sister Williams. Several were ready for baptism. Soon Haskell was able to organize the first black Seventh-day Adventist church in New York City. Sabbath, August 16, 1902, was a happy day for these new members. Mrs. Haskell described it in a letter of that date to Ellen White. <clears throat> our black, she said, uses a different word, but our black brethren held their first Sabbath meeting today in their own hall. For months we had been praying that God would give us a hall. The Lord heard our prayers and gave us a nice hall in the Miller Building, one of the finest buildings in this part of the city. This, the new hall is first class, the most aristoc aristocratic, black or white, can find no fault with its location. It holds about 150, is up one flight with elevator, or marble stairs as one prefers. Our brethren and sisters have gone to work in good earnest. There are about 20 black people who have taken their stand since we began. We have a young black woman in our mission family beginning to do Bible work and are hoping to find one more to come in and work with her. They hold meetings Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday evenings beside their Sabbath meetings and missionary meetings. Brother Luther Warren preached to, to them this forenoon. I wish you could have heard their social meeting. It did my soul good. Four of them were baptized last Monday. They are an earnest lot of Christians, happy in the truth and have an intelligent knowledge of it. But the cause of truth was progressing too smoothly to suit the enemy of souls. Working as he always does through human agents, 
to hinder the free course of the Holy Spirit, Satan now brought strong temptations to bear upon our two leading evangelists in New York City. Elder Frank had been blessed with unusual success in his early ministry. In one campaign in Trenton, New Jersey, he had gathered a church of nearly 200 members. This seemed to turn his head. Self-exaltation was his weakness. He loved praise and hated criticism, was impatient of delay or interference. So testified those who knew him best. Several messages of encouragement, warning, and reproof were sent him through God's appointed messenger. There were 16 letters from Mrs. White to Elder Frank, all written during or near the time he worked in New York. Quote, you have been presented to me as one who has a message for our cities, not merely for greater New York, but for many other cities in America. She urged him to follow Christ, to avoid show and display, which entail unnecessary expense and which do not win souls. Your danger, my dear brother, is in making the grave mistake of supposing that success depends on drawing a large congregation by outward display. To bring anything of a theatrical nature into the preaching of the Word of God is to use common fire instead of the sacred fire of God's kindling. Take up your work with greater humility and carry it forward by Christ-like methods. Let the truth have the field. For Christ's sake, do not hinder its progress by your own inventions. Warning him of the danger in his passionate words and rebellious spirit, she nevertheless assured him of God's concern for his personal welfare, even for his need to rest his overwrought nerves. My brother, you must have periods of rest in which you spend some time in the country, I have been instructed that during the summer you should leave the heat of the city for a cooler atmosphere. Your strained nerves will respond to the grateful restfulness of nature's beautiful scenes. Spoil not your influence by overworking in an effort to accomplish some great things. When you become worried as the result of overwork, every adverse word appears in large, bold characters before you, and you begin at once to make a raid against those who think, who you think are trying to work against you. Your hasty words are unexpected because often there is no cause for any such outburst. These things greatly detract from your influence. God desires you to unite with your brethren in your work. If you do this, if you do not do this, Satan will surely ensnare you. More than once, Elder Frank made confession of his wrongs and tried to straighten things up with his brethren. He wrote to Mrs. White that any instruction or counsel she had for him would be thankfully received and fully carried out. This letter brought great joy to her heart and to the hearts of his fellow workers. But again, at a conference meeting, he spoke insultingly of Elder Haskell Elder Warren, and others. Again he confessed, and there was joyful reconciliation. Elder Haskell 
came home from South Lancaster August 4, very sick, wrote his wife to Sister White, and did not leave his bed for over a week. But the Lord has wonderfully blessed him, and he is of better courage than I have seen for a long time. When Elder Frank heard he was sick, he came in so heartily and helped him that Elder Haskell has really fallen in love with him. Elder Haskell was worrying while sick over things he wanted attended to, and Elder Warren couldn't do them. Elder Frank came so lovingly and begged the privilege of running on any business and just took all care of Elder H. Was all as an own son could have been, and it did Elder H. H. more good than medicine. He had become wholly discouraged about the work here. It seemed as if all his efforts at union had failed to accomplish anything permanent, and he had made up his mind to get out of here as quickly as he could. I think that was really what brought on his sickness, but his very sickness did more than all his former effort, efforts at reconciliation, and now he is looking forward with pleasure to his fall and winter work with Elder Frank. They are planning to unite and make a bold front to the enemy. I have not seen Elder Haskell so happy and in such good spirits for years, and Brother Frank looks like a new man. We had a baptism last Monday. Eight were baptized. We have much to praise the Lord for. This development was short-lived. Complications arose that led Elder Haskell to write three months later, quote, A boy once asked how he, he got through the woods. It is reported that he said he whistled to keep up courage. I do not think that mere whistling would have always kept up our courage had not the Lord in various ways let shine his smiling face on us in a most remarkable manner from time to time. We have seen his guiding hand in special providences that has caused our hearts to rejoice in him and would then think that we would never be discouraged any more. So our courage is good, and unless we get unusually tired, I have no realizing sense that I am about 70 years of age. I have carried a burden for Elder Frank, and I do now so that quite frequently wife and self awake and rise in the night and pray for him. I think he honestly believes I'm jealous of his talents or audience. If I am, I'm wholly ignorant of it. This seems so real to him that it is the same old, old story over and over again when we are on committees or in the public. For two years, the Haskells had labored in New York under the handicap of criticism and party feeling. Time and again, when about to forsake the field, Haskell would recall messages from Mrs. White, such as, Be of good courage. God's providence will certainly open your way and give you precious victories. He was in your going. To New York City. I know that the Lord designed that Elder Frank should stand in his lot and place, speaking to large congregations. Then, when an interest is awakened, many would be benefited by the work that you can do. No one is to seek to close up the way that the Lord has committed to Elder Frank or the work he has committed to Elder Haskell. 
Brother Haskell, you cannot do the work necessary to be done to obtain a large audience. God sent Elder Frank to do that which you cannot do. It was his design that you should blend with Elder Frank and do the part of the work that he cannot do. End quote. Warnings against weaving self into the service of God were also sent to Elder and Mrs. Haskell. Quote, the speaker should never put self into his work. For by drawing the attention of his hearers to himself, he turns their attention from God. Let no one weave himself into the work of God. It was difficult for these two to refrain from defending themselves when slighting remarks about their methods of work came to the ears from Frank, the great evangelist, finally, in October 1902, when the lease on the hall expired, and while for the moment relations were friendly, Elder Haskell withdrew to Brooklyn, where he found a desirable location for his Bible training school. There he found new interests to build up and new workers to train, his helpers increased in number until at one time there were 19 in the mission family. Elder Frank, who had brought many people into the church, who could, as one of his converts testified, present all the Seventh-day Adventist doctrines in a finer and more convincing way than he had ever heard them presented, eventually forgot he was only the channel of light and blessing, not its source. Before long, this once great evangelist took glory to himself and finally lost his power, abandoned his mission, and ended by fighting the denomination and the very truths that he himself had once proclaimed with power. The Haskells remained in Brooklyn about another year. Then, after visiting various churches and conferences, moved to Nashville, Tennessee. Stephen, you are a marvel. Not long ago, you seemed about ready to retire from the work, and now here you are, back in harness and busier than ever. Yes, Hetty, it's amazing how God has renewed my strength. The Haskells knelt for a moment of prayer and praise and to plead for divine guidance and blessing before going to the early morning Bible class. It was true. The study of the word and the impartation of its riches to others had given him new life and vitality. Nurses rising at five o'clock and dressing by candlelight, church members walking dark city streets so as to be present at these early morning classes, learning to study the word of God, seeing such a spirit was what kept him young. As he wrote from Nashville at 72, if I should fold my hands and sit down and do nothing to further the truth of this last message, I should die in a short time. About the beginning of 1904, the Haskells had moved to Nashville, Tennessee, and there established a Bible training school. For a few months during that first year, they were assisted by two missionaries, L.J. Burgess and his wife, recently returned from India. They had come home for a short time, hoping to obtain authorization and support for opening a mission among the Hindustani people. But when they presented their request to the mission board, 
They were told regretfully there was no money available for the project. Mrs. Burgess carried her disappointment to her old friend, Stephen Haskell, for she knew he was deeply interested in the people of India. It was Haskell who, several years before, had encouraged Mrs. Burgess, Georgia Burris, to go alone to India as a self-supporting worker. He had sent her money given him from time to time for mission purposes. These occasional remittances had helped to piece out what little she received from teaching English to a few Hindu students while she was learning to speak their language and doing gospel work among the Hindu women in their homes. At one time, a man who conducted a gambling resort became strongly attracted to Elder Haskell. He even asked the privilege of living with the elder for a while. Haskell gave him a cordial invitation to do so, with the stipulation that the man, man spend an hour every day reading the Bible with him. The gambler cheerfully agreed, and the result was exactly what Haskell had anticipated it would be. <clears throat> His visitor became thoroughly converted. When this man disposed of his gambling interests, he asked his host how he should use the money obtained from their sale. Elder Haskell, never at a loss um, for an answer to this type of question, suggested that it be sent to Georgia Burris in India. From then on, as soon as the man received a payment on the property and equipment he had sold, he promptly gave it to Haskell to send to her. The day she received the first installment of that money, she joyfully and thankfully resumed language study, which she had been forced to abandon because she could not pay her teacher. Therefore, the remittances always seemed to arrive thereafter, I should say, just in time to answer some urgent need. In India, she married Burgess, who at the time was filling the office as secre of secretary treasurer for the new India mission field. He joined his wife in dedication to the people of India. Their plan was to establish a mission as a center of operation for the Hindustani-speaking people, a work the mission board was not in a financial position to support. <clears throat> but could they assume such a responsibility alone without the support from the mission board? Yet, um, how could they give it up? Think of it, Elder Haskell, just think of it, they mourned. Eighty million people and no one to tell them of Jesus soon coming and to teach them how to prepare to meet him in peace. And we, the only ones among all our workers who understand this people and can speak their language, hindered for the lack of a little money? Too wise to blame the mission board for not undertaking this new venture, Haskell simply said, Don't be anxious or troubled. The Lord owns the silver and the gold. He is interested in your work because it is his work. Come to Nashville and help us for a while. The experience you gain here will be profitable to you when you do open your mission in India and the Burgesses accepted the invitation. And I think that's where we should stop the net for tonight. That's a good breaking point, although the story goes on about the Burgesses. But we'll pick it up next time, Lord willing.